And so I'm going to share with you three points today about this first line of the prayer, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Point number one, God is our Father. In other words, Jesus said here, he's not just my Father. He said he's our Father. He says, pray our Father, who are which art in heaven, hallowed or hallowed, same word, be your name. Now this word hallow or hallowed appears only two times in the New Testament in this prayer in Matthew 6 and Luke chapter 11. But this same word from the Greek text, hallow, appears about 30 times in the New Testament. And 26 of those times, it appears as the English word sanctify. So the word hallow and sanctify are the exact same Greek word. And so Jesus is saying that when we pray to our Father that we are sanctifying or setting apart His great name from this corrupt, sinful world that we live in. And so you will see the same word in the Hebrew text in the Old Testament many times. You will see it written as sanctify or sanctification. And more times than not, it's used in juxtaposition to the word profane, the prof profane things of this world. And what it means is that God, listen to me, because this is going to be the crux of what I'm teaching you today. If you don't already know this, God, our heavenly father is set apart from all evil. That's important to know that. Because many people today, not just unbelievers, the unbelieving world believes what I'm about to say. But unfortunately, many believers, many Christians believe the same thing today because of their roots from the time they were born until they came in the church. They still believe that God is the one who is causing the evil in their lives. And it's important to know that God's name is set apart from all evil. That God, our Father Church, is not, listen to me carefully, He is not the one that is causing evil in one's life. If you're a child of God. Let me show you an Old Testament scripture that confirms this. Just one of many. Leviticus 22.32 God says, you shall not profane, there's that word profane, my holy name. He says, but I will be hallowed, set apart among the children of Israel. He says, I am the Lord who sanctifies you. That word sanctify is the same word hallow in the first part of the verse. I am the one who sets you apart. God wants you to know that he is separating from you and me all the evil that comes against our lives. God wants you to know that he is sovereign and that he has sovereignly done something about separating the evil from our lives by putting Jesus on the cross. And if there is evil in, their li in our lives, we'll see later on, it's because we have evil desires or because we choose to allow evil to come into our lives willfully because of bad desires or because of ignorance. What Jesus does in the Word of God that I believe is so foundational and relevant and important for us as believers to know, discern, and understand is that there are two fathers. There is a good one that the Bible talks about and there is a bad one. In life, through the first birth of our mother's womb, we experience with the bad father because we're all born into sin. In fact, if you'll read Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, you will find that we are by nature, through the first birth, children of wrath. God is not a God of wrath. Now, wrath will be poured out at the very end of this world, after we're all raptured and we're all in heaven. 
There will be seven years of God's wrath poured out on the unbelieving, rejecting of Christ world that we live in today. But we all start out with a bad father. We all are. When we're born again, we, however, come into relationship with the good father because the good father becomes our heavenly father. Why is this important? Why am I spending a few moments on this? It's important because I've learned as a pastor, as a, as a minister of the gospel, when I say, let's pray our father, some people internally reject that. Sometimes consciously and sometimes unconsciously. Why? Because some Christians do not have a good image of Father. And they do not want to talk to Father because a Father hurts and Father wounds. I'll talk about that more in just a few moments. The Scripture talks of two fathers. And I want you to know today that as a child growing up, your father, if there was anything in your father or your father figure that was good, even though he may have been an unbeliever, anything that came from him to you that was good, it came from the good father. It came from God. If there's anything that was bad or corrupt or evil in your earthly father, it did not come from God. It came from Satan the other father. I want you to stop and think about the Holy Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Even though the Bible does not use the word Trinity, Scripture confirms that there is a Godhead from the very first chapter of the Bible, Genesis 1, 26 and 28. God said, let us make mankind in our image and our likeness. So you've got God the Father, God the Son, Jesus, the Word of God, and God the Holy Spirit. Most believers, even some unbelievers, believe that Jesus, the second person of the Godhead, is the nice God. He's the kind God. Many believers believe that the third person of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit, He's the anointing, which He is. He's the powerful part of God. But unfortunately, as I previously stated because of father hurts, father wounds from their own personal life growing up. They see God, the heavenly father, the first person of the Godhead as the mean one. They think he's the mean one. And so when we pray church, we need to know who this father is. We need to know when we pray, who are we praying to? So number one, God is our father. Number two point, Satan is the bad father. Satan is the bad father. He's the one that has brought all evil into this world through Adam's sin. In fact, Jesus confirms this to all of us. And we have to have this revelation. We have to have this understanding that there is nothing that is good in Satan. That there is nothing evil in God, our Heavenly Father. In John 8, 38 through 44, listen to what Jesus is saying here. He says, I speak when I have seen with my Father. And he says to people here, you do what you have seen with your Father so automatically, Jesus lets us know there's two fathers. There are two fathers. They answered and said to him, being insulted, of course. They were insulted. Abraham is our father. And Jesus said to them, if you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. He says, but now you seek to kill me. Jesus is saying to them, a man who has told you the truth, which I heard from God. Abraham did not do this. He said, you do the deeds of your father. Then they said to him, we were not born of fornication. We have one father, God. And Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and came forth or came from God. 
nor have I come of myself. But he sent me. I could stop there and preach for a week that he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech, Jesus says to them? Because you are not able to listen to my words. Now listen to verse 44. Key, relevant, important for all of us in watching today. He said, you are of your father, the devil. He tells them who their father is. And their desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth. This is an absolute statement. There is no truth, not one shred of truth in this father. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources. For he is a liar and he is the father of it. I told you in the first message that Satan is a liar. Say, when do I know he's lying? When he moves his lips. Jesus said, he's a murderer from the beginning. I told you that he comes to steal. He comes to kill. He wants to kill your children. He wants to kill them by putting the wrong philosophies and doctrines and thoughts into their little minds so that they grow up half dead. He wants to kill your spouse. He wants to kill your career. He wants to kill your dreams, your hopes, your aspirations. He wants to kill everything that's good and precious and holy and sanctified unto your life. Well, how does Satan lie to me? I can't see his mouth moving. How does he lie to me? Well, the Bible says he lies by putting wrong thoughts into our minds. Thoughts that will always contradict the Word of God. So one of the lies that Satan puts into our minds when we sin is that God doesn't love you anymore. That God is angry now with you. That God's mad at you. That God has turned his back on you. That's what prayer is to a lot of people. It's all about believing lies. That the enemy tells us that God has said something evil about us. God doesn't do that. No. Satan, church, is the bad father. He's a murderer and he's a liar. It's all he knows to do. To murder, to kill, to steal, and to lie. Point number three, God is the good father. God is our father. Satan is the bad father. And God is the good father. In James 1.13, James, who was the half-brother of Jesus, I love this book. I love, because it's a pastoral book to people. He teaches like a pastor because he was one. And he teaches church doctrine in this, in this epistle. He teaches especially new Christians what you're going to experience now as a Christian. He lays it all out for us from chapter 1 through chapter 5. And in chapter 1, verse 13, listen to what he says. This is God speaking to us through James. He says, let no one say when he is tempted... That word tempted also means enticed. I am tempted or enticed by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil. Those five words cannot be tempted by evil is a different Greek word. It's one Greek word for those five words. Nor does he himself tempt or entice anyone to sin. But each one is tempted or enticed to sin when he's drawn away by his own, remember I said this earlier, by his own desires and enticed or tempted. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. Now, death could mean separation from God to an unbeliever, but death is an umbrella term in the Bible that means separation from God's blessing, favor, provision, 
Not that God ever takes away his provision, his blessing, but we can separate ourselves. God doesn't separate himself from the believer, but we separate ourselves. Death means corruption, chaos, panic, worry, all these things that the Bible says are negative and should not be part of the believer's life. He says, do, 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 do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. The worst kind of deception is self-deception. Don't be deceived. He says, every, would you say every? Every good gift, the word good. Good here means every beneficial and profitable gift. And every perfect gift, every gift literally that matures, completes, and perfects is from above and comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. This is what James is saying to us in verses 13 through 17. He's saying, don't be deceived, church. Believer, don't be deceived because everything that is evil in your life did not come from God because God is not evil. He's not evil. And that term cannot be tempted by evil. I said was one Greek word. This is what this one Greek word means, cannot be tempted by evil. It means that God cannot be touched or God cannot even be approached or even come into close proximity to any form of evil. He can't. There is absolutely, church, no evil in God or any evil that surrounds God. James is saying, if there's any evil in the believer's life, it's because they have been drawn away, enticed by their own carnal desires. And Satan takes those desires and he turns them the wrong way and he begins to draw us into sin. And that sin is what leads to chaos, to deaths, chaos, pain, all kinds of corruption that gets into our families. But here's the good news. God tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 10, that even when we are enticed, even though we're being tempted, the Bible says, number one, that God will not even allow us to be enticed or tempted above that which we are able to endure. And that secondly, God will make a way of escape because God is faithful. He'll make a way of escape. Even if it's even to our own because of our own doing, church, God makes a way of escape. Even if because we've done something that is evil, God will say, hey, when you come to him and say, Father, I've made a mistake here. I've messed up. I've blown it. Lord, I repent. I'm sorry. God says, what can I do for you right now? What can I do for you? We need to all understand that God is the good father and that Satan is the bad one. And that any evil that might be in our lives did not come from God. I've told you before, you all know this if you're a member of this church. This began in the very beginning part of my Christian experience some 44 plus years ago. I know I don't look that age, but hallelujah. <laughs> John 10, 10. Jesus said the thief, Satan, comes only but for to steal, kill, and destroy. But he said... Jesus, I have come that you might have life, Zoe, the life as God has it, and have it more abundantly. So early on in my Christian life, because I'm a very simple man, I really am simple. There's, there's nothing complicated about this guy you're looking at. I'm very simple. I have a foundation in my life that has served me well for these 44 years. And the foundation is that if anything comes into my life that's bad, it came from the devil. It did not come from my heavenly father. And if there's anything in my, I don't care where it comes from, anything in my life that's good, it came as a result of God and my father. God, my father. You know what? If every Christian on the face of the earth would learn that simple theology, 
we could turn this whole world around. Instead of attributing to God all the evil, the tornadoes, the calamities, the sickness, the crying to him and recognize we have an enemy because God has one. Why am I sharing all this? Well, because why would anyone, why would any Christian, anyone want to talk to the person who they think has caused all the problems in their lives? And unfortunately, many people feel this way. No, God is the reason that he exists in your life to love you, to bless you, and to get you out of the fixes you find yourself in. Even though some of these fixes might be the result of your own doing. We all do things wrong. And when it do, we do, sometimes it gets us into trouble. The best thing you can do is go to the good father. Don't stay away from him. Father, I've messed up here. You're the good father. The, good, the bad father of this world enticed me here with my own carnal desires. But Heavenly Father, I'm coming to you because I know you can fix this. I can't. I'm asking for your help. And you know what the good father will do? He will help you out of that fix. And in many cases, like he did with Joseph in the book of Genesis, he will cause the bad to be used to good. Somebody say amen. amen. Mm. I believe part of prayer is being able to come to the good father and to tattletale on the bad father. To tell the good father what the bad father has been saying to you and possibly trying to do into your life. Here's another verse that is good theology. Psalm 119.68, David said, you are good and do good. And then going back to James 1.17, he said that God is the father of lights. Well, who are those lights? Well, they're us. Jesus said in Matthew 5 that we're the light of the world. He's the Big light of the world, we're the little lights of the world. But Paul confirmed it in Philippians 2.15. He said that you may become blameless and harmless. Children of God, without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. Jesus has put his light within us. And the father of lights, he's the father of us. And then we read in James 1.17 that there is no variation in the father. This is the only place in the Bible this word variation appears. What does that mean? That there is not even the remotest possibility that God could ever turn away from being good. Never. Why? Because he is good. So the Lord's Prayer Church begins with our Father. After the resurrection, Jesus was now in his resurrected body, and he's now talking to Mary. And he said to her in John 20, verse 17, Jesus said, Don't cling to me, Mary, for I have not yet ascended to my Father. But go to, listen, go, listen, listen, but go to my brethren, go to the brothers. And say to them, I am ascending to my father. Listen, listen. And your father. And to my God and your God. So then, what, what's, what's the revelation here? The re revelation is, does our father, when Jesus taught us to pray this way, is he just saying us to the father? I don't think so. Jesus is saying, hey, Mary, go tell the brothers. I'm about to go to dad and I'm going to talk to dad. He's now my dad. He's your dad also. And go tell the brothers. So obviously Jesus is referring here not just to us when we pray our father, but he's referring to us and Jesus. When we pray to the father, 
Who are we praying to the Father in whose name? Jesus' name. Hey, Father, I've come to you today in Jesus' name. And oh, by the way, Father, he's my brother. And I want you to know he's my friend. And I want you to know, Father, I'm grateful for what my friend, your son, did for me. So now I can come and pray. Our Father, when I'm praying, he's there with me praying to you, Father. We're in this together. And I know that when he sits at your right hand, he is interceding perfectly for me. Hey, prayer is talking to Dad.